are going to record and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to another installment of our ongoing Ask the Editor series. I'm so excited to welcome Michael Nye, editor of Story Magazine. Michael is joining us from Ohio. How's it going? Things good? Uh, things are great. If perchance you hear a baby in the next hour, um, I have a five month old right now. She's on a walk with her grandmother, but okay. if it comes bursting through the door, you might. <laughs> <laughs> We've been warned. Yes, I, I especially appreciate you taking the time because I know you, you had a baby and I know how like chaotic that time is. So uh, <laughs> thanks for giving us your time today. Of course. Uh, so Michael Nye is the author of three books of fiction, most recently the story collection, Until We Have Faces. His writing has appeared in Kenyan Review, Epic, Boulevard, Lit Hub, and The Millions, among many others. He lives in Ohio and is the editor of Story. And Story Magazine is a tri-annual print publication devoted to the complex and diverse world of narrative and short fiction. Since 1931, work that originally appeared in story has been reprinted dozens of times, including in editions of the Best American Short Stories, the Pushcart Prize, and the Prize Stories. Recent contributors include Carolyn Farrell and Valente George Singleton, Crystal Wilkinson and Alex Olin. Relaunched in 2018, story is a 501c3, proudly based in Columbus, Ohio. So again, uh, thank you, welcome Michael, and thank you to all of you for joining in. Um, so feel free to just anytime if you have a question, just type it into the chat and I will do my best to work it into the conversation. Um, so I will just kick things off <laughs> uh, and tell us, um, actually, I wanna start because I saw on Twitter recently that you said you were up at five in the morning reading submissions for the magazine. Um, and I just want to hear, like, is that typical? What, what is a day in the life of <laughs> an editor for Story Magazine? Yeah, typical, not exactly. So about, um, I'd say 10 years ago when I started at the Missouri Review, it was my first full-time job in literary magazines. And I found that I was gassed in the evening to, to make writing time. Mm -hmm. So I got in the habit of getting up early to go write. So I would get to a, a coffee shop in downtown Columbia, Missouri, about 6 a.m., 6.15-ish, um, right until I had to go to my job and then go to my job. And so I have long gotten up early, um, mm -hmm. five, six, something like that, and continued that writing practice um, after I left the Missouri Review when I moved to D.C., from D.C. back here to Ohio. Um, but as we've already mentioned in this chat, uh, my wife and I just had our first child in February. And mm -hmm. so getting things done has gotten a little bit off kilter. I have gotten um, remarkably little of my own writing done um, the last couple of months because I, I've been spending a lot of my time in the morning working on story, which is um, reading submissions, responding to emails, that kind of administrative work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes in the morning, I'm just holding the baby. Sometimes I'm asleep, uh, some combination of the two. Yeah. <laughs> stuff, um, all those things, because um, in addition to story, my own writing and being a new parent, I work full time at Ohio State. Um, so I have a day job with them that is eight to five. And then, of course, just everything else, um, mm -hmm. the pandemic and trying to, you know, get clean clothes and get groceries and all that. So a lot of what happens with story is getting it done when it gets done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally makes sense. And do you have an editorial staff helping you? What does that look like? That kind of team behind the scenes? Yeah, so um, on our homepage, we have an about up in the top left corner, and you'll see that we have an associate editor, um, Latanya McQueen, who lives out in Iowa. Um, she's in the middle of um, promoting a new book, and of course she's uh, working as a tenure track professor. She's very busy. Um, we just started with a brand new group of readers, so we do have, if I saw correctly in uh, the Brady Bunch thing. Um, one of our volunteer readers, uh, Mark Steinwex, is on the call. Um, and so we like have 15 to 20 readers that go through the work and, and forward things to me. And then this past year, we started an internship program with Denison University, which is about 30 minutes east of Columbus. So we have some student interns that do work for us as well. Some of that's reading submissions, but that's also 
marketing emails, um, mm -hmm. readings, um, all the kind of stuff that makes a, a literary magazine um, front and center in your mind. Mm -hmm. So we're all volunteers of, in some capacity, um, but it's pretty fluid in terms of who gets to do what and making sure that the magazine's solid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, totally. Um, and so tell us, uh, tell us about the magazine itself, because I understand it started in uh, 1931, but that it's been out of print for some, and then it's been resurrected, and <laughs> yeah. sounds like uh, some up and downs with the journal. So uh, can you take us through that history a little bit? Sure. So the, the magazine was founded in 1931 by Martha Foley and her husband, and I believe they were based in Vienna for a couple of years, then they moved to Mexico, then they split up, and story went in and out of publication um, into the 60s, where they do a couple issues and they fold or go dormant. Um, the story that I think most people are going to be familiar with is the one that was started in 1989 by a woman named Lois Rosenthal. She was based down in Cincinnati. Her husband, Richard, was the publisher, and story was a, a quarterly publication that I think every writer wanted to be in. Mm. Uh, they published for about 10 years, um, a, a wide range of voices and styles. Um, and then the company that um, uh, Story was affiliated with or attached to was sold. And Lois said, I don't want to do it anymore. Mm. So she folded it. And then about 15 years later, uh, a guy at uh, York College in Pennsylvania, Travis Kurowski, reached out to Lois and said, could I restart story? She said, I don't care. And so he started it off as an annual and it had a very different look. It, it was more like The Believer, if any of you mm -hmm. are familiar with that magazine. Um, I believe he did a double-sided issue um, for the first one. And it was an annual um, really based on um, having students involved, a lot of really great design elements. Um, and after a couple of years, Travis, like a lot of professors at a liberal arts college, had one too many things to juggle and he folded it. And so at AWP, I guess it was 2018, whichever one Tampa was, mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to Dave Housley of uh, Barrel House and we were just on the floor just chatting. And he said, oh, so, you know, I was folded story. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, I had just left the Missouri Review two years earlier. I'd been dying to get back into literary magazines and I'm doing the kind of editorial work that I love. And I just I heard, oh, maybe there's an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. And so I emailed Travis and he said, uh, sure, let me think about it. And a couple months later, I drove out to his house and met with Travis. Uh, we talked about our vision for the magazine and he turned it over to me. And so um, I filed the paperwork with the state of Ohio in August. Six months later, the very first relaunch issue was spring 2019, um, was out in the world and we were off and running from there. That's great. Uh, so would you say you have a new vision for the magazine or that it's taking a kind of different direction under your helm or are you continuing with the tradition of the magazine? How do you see it evolving now? Yeah, it, it's a fascinating question. So um, as many of you probably know, recently Glimmer Train and Tin House stopped publishing as very magazines. Um, Glimmer Train in particular, I think, really had a sense of, of telling the type of stories that I admired. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to do a print magazine with a real focus on the stories themselves. Um, for those of you that have not seen a copy of Story, there's not a lot of accoutrements to it. We do illustrations of our authors in the front. Um, we put a lot of thought into our front cover and our inside back cover and inside front cover to give it some, some uh, color. But I really want to focus on the stories themselves, and that's selfishly what I like as a reader. Um, for everything that we've um, gained from having the uh, ability to publish online and get really great access to a wide range of voices and styles and stories, truth be told, I don't feel like I pay a lot of attention when I read online. Um, I tend to zig and zag. You know, I, I read in a kind of a Z motion or a T, I feel disengaged. And that's not the fault of the author, that's my fault. So for me, having a print magazine that really focused on the stories themselves was crucially important to me. Mm -hmm. And I felt that if we um, can focus on telling great stories and showing our readership that we find and curate the best kind of work, um, we can develop that kind of an audience and make sure that the focus is on the authors and their work rather than all the other design elements. Um, though, to be fair, I also don't know how to do a lot of those design elements. <laughs> um, so keeping it simple is another big part of, of being a literary magazine editor. 
Sure. And we have a question uh, relatedly, uh, what qualities of a short story submission do you typically look for? And what might help writers, <laughs> what might help writers get accepted at story? I think it's, um, it is the question everyone wants to know, like what makes a great story? What makes a great story story? Mm -hmm. um, and how, how can writers um, best market their work to your magazine? Yeah, it's the question editors always get asked. It's the question <laughs> always struggle to answer. Um, and I'll start by giving you the, the answer that you initially hate, which is, well, it really helps to read our magazine. And it does. Um, one of the things that we're committed to is accessibility with story. So usually going back one issue, we try to make as much of that work available online as possible. So our autumn 2020 issue sold out. I'm, I'm bit by bit putting that issue entirely online. So looking at work that um, the authors that uh, we've published recently, I think is very helpful to you. Um, if you're the type of writer that really admires conjunctions, we're probably not the best market for you. We're not really into postmodernism. I don't really deeply admire lots of bells and whistles. Um, you know, um, books I love are like Richard Rousseau and Claire Lombardo. I, I tend to be more of a, a narrative um, American realist um, mm -hmm. Um, partly that because when we edit work, it's really important that I have um, a similar vision to what the author has for the story. I'm not very useful to you if um, I'm the wrong editor for your work. And, and that does happen. Sometimes we pass on a story because I will write to the author. I just don't see an editorial path forward. Mm -hmm. um, I don't quite know what to do with the story, even if it might have you know, elements that I admire. Nonetheless, I don't wanna have story be only my vision of what a magazine can be. I wanna make sure that it's a, a wider spectrum of what's happening in the short story. So I will often forward something to um, some of our volunteers and say, hey, what do you think about this? I'm on the fence. And I've certainly taken stories that um, my staff has really fought for that I'm a little less crazy about. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's important that the, uh, the editor of a magazine isn't uh, the kingmaker, that we have a lot of different voices that come into our, our magazine and, and help shape the work. Um, as for what you know, we're looking for, um, yeah, being familiar with the guidelines, of course, does help. <clears throat> you know, a clean copy manuscript, you know, um, free of errors, it's cohesive. Um, thematically, it's resonant. It has a really good sense of what it's about. Um, I think a story shouldn't necessarily answer all the questions it raises, but it should explore those questions. Um, and it is helpful to, to see something that um, in some fashion, some capacity, I have not read before. Mm -hmm. um, whether it takes a risk with characterization, it makes an interesting leap in terms of style. It has a thing, it has a quality to it that makes it uh, unusual and memorable and engaging. Mm -hmm. I don't answered your question at all but no no you absolutely did <laughs> that really makes sense and I'm interested uh, you mentioned working with writers and uh kind of editorial work that you do can you talk about a recent story maybe that wasn't fully there why you took it even though it wasn't fully there and the extent of the changes that you and the writer worked on yeah, absolutely. So in the um, first relaunch issue, uh, issue number four, we published a story by a young writer named Johanka Delgado called Denise. <clears throat> um, and this story came in and uh, it is available on our website if you'd like to take a look at it. There's a Puerto Rican man living in New York. He's older, um, late 60s. Um, his niece also comes to New York and he's been told to keep an eye out for her. And he develops a bit of a crush on her. Mm. Um, and their family, and that's creepy, but that's part of what makes it really interesting, um, that it takes kind of a thematic risk. Um, and then it had a really nice sense of moving back and, and forth between time and his memories of his, um, his wife, um, he's still married, who continues to live in Puerto Rico and he does not see her. Um, and it had just a really good sense of the neighborhood that they were in in New York. Um, each New York is different, right? Uh, Martin Scorsese's New York is very different from Spike Lee's New York, right? Um, so it had a great sense of, of time, place, and characterization. Um, but I thought the ending, when I first read it, um, missed. It had, a, um, it had uh, him going down an elevator. And so the elevator moves down, there's some interior thought, the elevator moves down, there's some interior thought. And for lack of better words, um, it's a bit workshoppy. You can, it gives you a feeling of, um, oh, look at, look at the way that the elevator and his mindset come together. And like, that's fine. And that's well done. But 
I'm familiar with that move. Um, but I really liked the story. It had a lot of these elements that were really strong. And so I, I wrote the author back and I said, look, I don't know exactly how this would go, but based on everything I'm seeing here thematically, I think it's really important that he goes back to Puerto Rico and sees his wife. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that would be. I don't know what would happen. That just seems like the right move for this story. Because I had a sense thematically of, of what the author was after. Um, and that just comes honestly from repetition. I, I've probably read 10,000 stories in the 15 years that I've worked on a literary magazine. I do have some sense of like, you know, um, where the story might be close. Um, but I left it up to the author to see if she could pull it off. Um, I didn't write it for her. I didn't tell her what should happen. I said, hey, if, if this is helpful to you, if, if my notes make a difference, I'd love to see your revision. Um, she did a revision. Uh, it was terrific. We accepted the piece. Um, and it's an author that has some incredible talent. If I saw it correctly on Twitter, um, Yohanka has not one but two pieces in the forthcoming Best American Science oh. section. Yeah, I mean, just so the again, like the style mm -hmm. characterization, like it's clearly an author who's really, really good, even if the story doesn't quite work. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to get a sense, like, can I trust the author to, to do this kind of revision? Um, so that's one example of where we, you know, put it back in the author and said, hey, I'd like to see this. Um, once or twice, we've also done some minor things, but that's, I think, the big glowing example, because, you know, that was her first publication at the time. And now Johanka has published in Paris Review, a public mm -hmm. space. Um, she's a Stegner Fellow this coming year. Um, you know, we, rec we recognize the talent and we want to make sure that we nurture it in whatever way we can. Yeah. Can you actually, since you mentioned it, can you just talk a little bit about how awesome it feels to discover a new writer? Because <laughs> it sounds like if that was her first publication. And I know um, that's like what editors really want to do, because I know some writers get sort of discouraged. They feel like I don't have any publication credits. I'm never going to break in. But in fact, so many editors from what I here actually really love finding new talent and that's that's what makes it all worth it for them. Yeah, and it's incredibly hard to do now. I mean, it's I think it's relatively easy to publish something online. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of online magazines. Um, if, if you're consistently sending out your work and writing regularly, you will publish something. Um, I think most writers that you and I know are not crazy about the first story they ever published, right? Like it was great at the time, but you look back, you're like, eh. Um, <laughs> those are so many online publications. It's really hard to get somebody that's going to take their chance on a first publication, sending it to story. Mm -hmm. um, that's tough. Um, another person we recently published, uh, Laura, Laura Rosenthal, um, she uh, got her MFA at Emerson College. And I know a couple of Emerson people we published um, one of her professors like three or four issues earlier. So she had some familiarity with stories. She just hadn't been sending her work out. Um, so one of the things that, um, you know, those of us listening to this should remember, if you don't have any publications, please say that in your cover letter. Um, this would be my first publication of Accepted. That's great to know. Um, that's something that, um, yeah, can make a difference. Um, mm -hmm. Because as you said, Becky, that's something we take a, a huge point of pride in. Um, and so if we have something that we're like, okay, this there's a lot of great stuff here, we're not sure, and, and we look at the cover letter and it's, oh, this would be my first publication, um, that might be something where we, we would make the extra effort to work with the author to make sure that it's the best version of their work. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned publishing online, so we have a question here. Can you just talk about what, uh, which works you publish online versus print? You publish some things, the recent work online, but then the rest in print. How does that break down? Yeah, so when, um, when I took over story from Travis, I wanted to get as much of the work that he had done online. Um, we didn't have a ton of physical copies. So um, if you're looking through our authors and the information we have on our website, Travis's issues are one, two, and three. Um, the stuff that was published prior to 2014, it's a long and not very interesting story. Um, that requires, that, that means we have to reacquire the rights to publish it online. That's just a, a lot of work. Um, and I'm not, based on my experience, I'm not sure that there's a ton of interest in finding Amy Bloom's story from like 1992. <laughs> so we haven't done a lot of that, but what we'll do is say um, issue four comes out, 
Um, we'll tease out the first two or three pages of those stories, but we don't make the whole thing available online because we want people to buy that issue. Mm -hmm. Once the next issue's out, issue five, again, we tease those out and then we start putting work from issue four online for free. Mm -hmm. um, why do we do that? Uh, one, we talked about accessibility. You know, Not everybody can afford to buy the magazine. We want you to have the opportunity to read these stories. Um, we make them available in due time, probably you know, anywhere from four to nine months after they're in print. Um, second, um, people tend not to buy back issues. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, people want the current issue. That's the one that they buy, even if it's only a single copy. We don't move a lot of back copies. And my wife loves me, but she doesn't want to see those boxes in the basement. I need, to, I need to get rid of those. I need to keep my print run lower. Um, so I, I've been trying to target it so that we're, you know, only, we're printing only what we've got. Um, but I want to make sure that we're balancing, you know, the, the accessibility question that I think is important to literary magazines and authors. And also, you know, frankly, just the financial aspects of, of running a magazine and making sure we're sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, so then we have another question. This is sort of a craft question that maybe you can speak to from your own writing experience, but it also relates to your editorial experience. Um, so you story features a number of longer stories um, and what justifies publish? What is what does a long story need to justify its length? Uh, why not just cap every story at 5,000 words? Um, and how do you how do you decide on a longer story? Yeah, and so the first word that popped to mind is energy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, one of the challenges we've seen with the longer stories that people send to us um, is that they begin to sag in the middle, right? Somebody wrote a long story and because they wrote a long story, they assume that, well, that's the story, that's the way it's gonna stay. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a, a long story or a novella has a different type of um, energy to it. I think it's one of the hardest forms to write. It doesn't have the same quality that a novel or a short story does. Um, a lot of novels I think have not one but two big plot points. One of which tends to be resolved about 50% of the way through. The other gets resolved about 90% of the way through. And so a long story novella might rather than having two plot points just have one, you know, and the story has legs. It has something worth exploring, something that needs to be explored. Um, why do longer stories? I like them, uh, plain and simple. <laughs> I like reading longer stories. I find them interesting because I, I read with a physical copy in my lap. I like to spend three hours reading something as opposed to you know 30 minutes. Um, and there's not a lot of venues um, for publishing longer stories. There's a couple of places that say, you know, if it's really good, we'll think about it, but they typically don't publish longer work. And so um, it's a form that I think a lot of writers like experimenting with. I think many writers like novellas where they feel they've got a particular piece that really fits that longer form, but then they publish it and, you know, where's it gonna go, right? The last story in your story collection, maybe. Um, we'd like to be that venue. So we published a, a longer story by Kyle Miner, which is just outstanding. Um, we did a Lawrence Coates story. Uh, Karen Lynn Greenberg had a longer one that I think clocked in about 12,000 words. We did a longer Michelle Herman story. Um, it doesn't have to go to the full 25,000, right? That's just an arbitrary number where we're like, that seems like a good cap. Um, occasionally we have people send us uh, a 75,000 word story. <laughs> That's not a story, right? Like, Jenny Awful doesn't write books that long. So like yeah, some familiarity with the form, of course, mm -hmm. helps, but um, yeah, we like them. We just, mm -hmm. we, doing them. we like being one of the few venues that can publish them. And so we want to have that opportunity out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned a few of these stories, but can you talk about one that got you really excited on first reading and maybe why, what did that story have where you were, you felt like I have to publish this? Well, I'll talk about something that's a little bit harder. Um, we got a George Singleton story called What a Dime Costs. Um, and for those of you unfamiliar with George's work, um, he's funny and he has great voice. And I'm oversimplifying. Um, but when I was at the Missouri Review, I, I um, read three or four George uh, submissions. I gave them to Spear Morgan, the editor-in-chief, and he said no. And that was endlessly frustrating to me. And so I've been a big admirer of George for a long time. And so even from the first page, um, I was smiling, I was laughing. Um, 
it just had a quality to it from the jump that I thought was, was really compelling. Um, and that's something certainly that I'm looking for. Um, usually page one, you just get a sense of the author's world. Um, it pulls you in. It, it gives you a sense that the author is in control of the work, that his or her vision is the one that you're settling into. And it's, it's written with complete and total confidence. Mm -hmm. Um, we just took a story uh, by a writer named uh, Karina Valenados, um, who's sent to us, I think, five or six times. We had not yet taken anything of hers. And this story just, it's about a woman moving from New York to uh, uh, California to be near her adult daughter. And it just, it has that sense of um, time and loneliness kind of built in mm -hmm. the jump. And um, I'm just captivated right away. And so uh, most of the stories we, in fact, all the stories that we accept, um, they've got something on page one that mm -hmm. um, we're responding to. Um, and you just feel that you're in the confident hands of an author who knows what she or he wants to say, um, and you're, you're taken along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And sort of counter to that, you mentioned like something that you've seen before that felt like kind of like a mm -hmm. workshop story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there something that you can identify because you read so many stories, is there something I would never want to say that writers shouldn't write in a certain way or shouldn't write about certain things, <laughs> but is there something that we can tell our writers that is um, kind of things to avoid that editors see a lot, a certain kind of style or trope or kind of lethargy <laughs> maybe in the prose? Yeah, it's funny. I just posted on Twitter this week. I think I forget exactly the way I phrased it, but I said something like, I would never say it, but I am very, 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 very close to saying I will never publish another story about a creative writing teacher or something like that. <laughs> um, I, and so what do I mean by that? Um, I think a lot of the people that send to literary magazines teach or have taught and falling back on, on what you know about the sad poet or you know the tenured faculty member that hasn't published a book in 20 years. <laughs> Boy, I get, I get so many of those. Yeah. And I, you know, um, work is so important to just staying alive for, you know, taking care of yourself, your family, um, being able to buy something, um, you know, reading a story where somebody really has a sense of the, the technical proficiency that goes into a job, whether it's, you know, accounting or laying brick, um, you just, you have a sense of a world that mm -hmm. the is writing about confidently and so I get I get very tired of stories about college professors I mean it's just not particularly amusing I mean can you be better than Julie Schumacher's novel maybe but mm, probably not. <laughs> um what else do, do I see a lot of um cancer stories unfortunately divorce stories um you know where thematically the elements are very similar to other stories that I've read what makes this particular one different? What makes this one um, unique? What are we learning about a marriage, about heartbreak, about mm -hmm. longing that we don't read in other places? And if you think that's really hard, well, yeah, <laughs> that's, that, that's the idea. Um, I, I guess that um, the other thing that I, I'll see a lot of, like with the example of uh, Johanka's story with the elevator, um, particularly with graduate student work, it feels like there's one thing they do really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of the story is kind of forgotten about, mm -hmm. right? They're trying to tell a story in second person or they're trying to tell a story from a different gender perspective. Um, and you can see that they've worked really hard on that one element, but then other things are kind of forgotten about or a little bit heavy. Um, and that, that's hard. I mean, again, I, I, I feel like I'm being a little bit vague about these points, but. Um, usually there's not a real holistic sense that the story is completely coming together. Mm -hmm. Aspect that's done really well, whatever thing was that like sparked the genesis for the idea, you know, the thing like, oh, I'm going to write about this, whether it's character, language, plot, whatever. There's too much focus on that and not the whole story. Um, keeping in mind that our staff reads so many stories and we love reading them, but you got to grab our attention somehow mm -hmm. um, in order to keep us compelled and interested, yeah. Mm -hmm. And since we're talking about MFAs, I take it it shouldn't matter if a writer has an MFA. Uh, if you read in the cover letter, letter yeah, th that's the impression I get. And it, I, I would imagine it's almost preferable <laughs> or at least refreshing to encounter a writer who is not following the kind of traditional path. Yeah, it's, I think, and I was guilty of this when I was a graduate student as well. I think 
graduate students tend to send out their work a little bit early. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a difference between a, a student in an MFA program and a student in a PhD program. Um, age, experience, uh, both in workshop and in life, um, I think it shows up. Um, you know, I'll mention the cover letter because I, I brought it up when talking about, you know, looking for, you know, uh, somebody's first publication. Uh, we don't read the cover letters first. Um, we might look at them later when thinking about who to pass this along to. Some people in their cover letters will mention that they read a particular story um, or I met them or um, I wrote something um, in, in a previous submission. So we'll look at that. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, most of this all comes down to, do we like this story and do I want someone else to read it? And the cover letter, you know, um, doesn't make a tremendous difference. It's important to have one, but it doesn't have to say a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, I think that's really important. I always tell people if they're spending over an hour on the cover letter, they're doing it wrong. <laughs> it right. should be very, just use the standard, you know, professional, polite, uh, just be honest. I've never published before, or this will be my first publication, whatever, and that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's all you have yeah. to say. Yeah. Um, so have you ever asked an author for visions and then subsequently passed on the work? And what was that process like? Not at Story, mm -hmm. but at Missouri Review. Mm -hmm. um, because, so because um, of all the stuff that me and my staff are juggling with Story, um, we can't really do a developmental edit. Um, we can really only ask for revisions when it's really, really close, which means our suggestions are very specific. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think off the top of my head, I can think of three or four times I've asked an author for a revision with story. And it's like something very, very particular. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different from editing. Um, there's some things that we know in the editorial process will get um, tightened or cleaned up with particular scenes with dialogue or a clause maybe, um, but a whole a whole revision, no. Um, at Missouri Review, I, I, don't, I think there was one story by, um, oh, I can see her face, I can't remember her name. Um, we asked her to change the point of view, which mm. is massive revision. Um, she did, it took her like six months and she nailed it. But most of the time when I asked for a revision, at Missouri Review, it was still ultimately going to be no. Um, them is the breaks. I mean, when I was <laughs> managing editor, I could at least hang my hat on, well, it wasn't my decision, which you know, um, is a little bit unfair. Um, now it is my decision <laughs> and um, I don't do it a lot. It's pretty unusual. Um, I recently gave somebody, um, I don't recall the author's name. Um, I sent her a, a longer email turning down the work and I said, here's why here's some of the, the decisions that I, I don't think quite work in the story. Um, if, if this is useful to you, um, I'd love to see your revision, but I'd also love to see more of your other stories. Um, I have not scanned through the submission manager. I don't think she has sent us anything new, but that was only like four weeks ago. So it does happen, um, but not a lot simply because of you know, time constraints on our staff. Mm -hmm. Um, so if a LibMag sends a writer a nice rejection and says, uh, this wasn't right for us, but we hope to see more of your work, and then they submit again, and it does sound like you encourage multiple, like writers should keep trying you. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that one writer who submitted about six times and finally got an acceptance. So, um, but how, if there's a personal rejection note, should they go through submittable and or should they reach out to you personally and say, thank you for that encouraging note. I just want to let you know that I resubmitted or should they should they just do it through the form and sort of not be in touch with the editor? A little bit of both. Um, please send it through the submission manager. Um, <laughs> as all of you just experienced, even though I might have the correct link in my Gmail, that doesn't mean I won't be 15 minutes late. I just lose stuff. If it's not in submission manager, I lose it. And mm -hmm. despite my best efforts, like if, if somebody sends me an email attachment, I'm going to forget. Um, sure, if you would like to send me an email saying, hey, I just resubmitted, or hey, thank you, I appreciate it, that's great. Uh, it, it's probably not going to, to start a conversation necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but it's a, a nice thing to hear. And then to mention in the cover letter, hey, you know, you, you encouraged me, I appreciate that. Um, that's important to us. And one of the things we, we do try to cultivate with story is a uh, 
uh, a sense with our readership that we are a good community and it can only be you know so personal given how many people and how large it is but um, it is important that um, we're an environment where authors feel like they're encouraged to send us their work and we can look at the authors we've published and are publishing in the future and say yes it took five or six times before mm -hmm. we took some of their pieces uh, but when we send an encouraging rejection um, yes we mean it um, do you take that to heart um, and if you ever see my name in the sig, it may feel like boilerplate, but if my name's there, I'm the one that wrote that email. I'm the one that sent it. Um, please do uh, know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a question here about contests. Uh, so you run one annual contest, is that correct? correct. And so can you talk about uh, how is the winner chosen? So you narrow down, you, you have your team of readers, you screen you know, hundreds of submissions, and then you say, okay, these are our top 30 we're gonna pass it on. Is there a guest editor or do you do that? And what is that process like for choosing the one <laughs> magical winner? Yeah, it's um, it's in progress. So uh, <laughs> idea, when I was at the Missouri Review, they run the editor's prize. I would guess everybody on this call has probably tried submitting to the editor's prize because it's $5,000 and it's in all three genres. Um, so the editor's prize at the Missouri Review received 3,000 submissions, um, literally. That's a lot. Um, when we started the uh, foundation prize here at Story, I certainly never expected to get 3,000 submissions, and we did not. Um, we got close for about 200. Um, the second year, that number doubled. And so the first year, I simply read everything. Um, we, it's only open for, I believe it's four months. I read everything, anything that I thought, okay, there's something here. I added it to a different file and um, all the contributing editors read the pieces. Um, we created a Google sheet. We just you know, added like a general score, um, some commentary, some thoughts, you know, for our top, you know, 20. Mm -hmm. This year, because it doubled, I thought I could do that again. I, <laughs> I um, there, were, there was a much bigger um, pool of, um, Possibles. I think it was like 70 or 75. And more than once, one of the editors is like, Michael, what, what is this? I'm like, sorry, I'm sorry. Like, I, just, I liked page three. <laughs> but we always, we always find a winner. Um, we published one story the first year, which was Anglade's piece, Night Watch, which is incredible. Um, this year, we're publishing Carl Greenfeld's story, uh, Womanly Words, which comes out in the next issue. Which I assure you all is going to ship in August, even though it should have shipped in June. Uh, but we also took two more pieces um, from the, the prize, uh, the foundation prize this year, um, one by a writer named Eric Rowe, the other by a writer named Heather Ronson. So we do sometimes take um, not just the winner, but other pieces because the, the quality at the very top of the contest pile is very, very strong. It's just getting through all of them in a timely manner can be, can be tough. Um, I have looked into getting a name or sponsor for the contest. Um, I don't want to give away names yet, but like I'm, I'm working on it. Um, but again, limited time, like the story foundation prize is a perfectly okay name <laughs> and, and having, um, having the prize money and seeing the authors who have, um, had their work published, I think will help us to get more entries, uh, this coming year. Mm -hmm. and, and I will make a note after this meeting that I need to think long and hard about improving my system if we get, again, like double the entries. Yeah, you have to get up earlier. <laughs> yeah, I can do 4 a.m. once or twice, maybe. It's amazing. Um, and so does Story Magazine give equal opportunity to non-US submissions, specifically from Native Asian writers? Yeah, so um, we took a piece by a writer, I'm gonna butcher the name, he lives in, uh, Guernsey, um, which is a little island between England and France. I, I think there was a movie about a book club. Um, so we take um, work, um, mm -hmm. and anybody can submit to us at any time. Um, we don't have any restrictions on that. Um, I know it doesn't entirely count. I think we've published um, three Canadian authors. Um, so yeah, we, we welcome work from all over. Oh, oh gosh, I almost forgot. Um, yeah, um, we took two pieces that are um, from African writers. Um, uh, one who's a student at Rutgers, another student at uh, the University of Missouri. Uh, we nominated um, each one for the Kane Prize um, in 2019 and 2020, respectively. Um, I believe Iggy's story is on, it is, is online. It's a story called um, Landscaping. Um, 
To fund me story is not online. That's uh, it's, it's a story called God Has No Gunmen. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we definitely look to publish uh, voices like that and, and we don't just say it, we actually do so. <laughs> uh, can you talk about themes you'd like to see more of? I think that's probably a common question people ask editors too. Um, but yeah, but what are you what are you not seeing that you that you want that you're hungry for? Oh, that's like giving a starving man a menu. Um, <laughs> I'm not. I um I I'm looking for things that don't answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm looking for things that I haven't considered or thought of before. Um, whether it's a, a a character that is wholly unique and unusual, um, a, a plot or storyline. Um, a use of language that's really um, powerful and evocative, um, whatever kind of complexity that you might um, think of or imagine. Um, we published a story a couple of issues ago where um, a rolled up rug appears on the front porch and there may or may not be a dead body in it. <laughs> Ever narratively clear what precisely happens and yet the story works incredibly well. Um, a more specific answer that I'm thinking about because we just took a story that does this really well. I love seeing first person stories that really have a sense of temporal and spatial distance. Um, I do find myself a little exhausted by first person present tense. Um, I just feel like it's losing the strength of the first person mm -hmm. um, where it's not just what happens but how the character tells the story whenever you get to that end point. I, I think that's something that American writers do remarkably well. I mean, nobody does first person novels better than American writers, right? And so um, I do look for stories that do that with a lot of strength. And we just took a story by a writer named um, Sharon Pomerantz, uh, which I think is only like eight or nine pages long, but it's set in the early nineties. Um, you know, why is this narrator still thinking about this moment? Um, which the story begins to answer as it weaves forward, um, just in terms of the technical aspect. Um, that's something that I look for. So artistically, something that can't answer Becky's question. <laughs> first person, good luck. Yeah. Right, it must be hard to identify like what you wanna see more of. Um, it's just, I mean, editors always say they wanna be surprised. So uh, surprise, surprise you. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, certainly within within reason, but I mean, it, it's challenging, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we realize that um, people that are publishing short stories probably are aiming to do more, right? They want to publish a book. Um, they want to publish a novel. They, they would like to have a career. In some ways, a short story can be viewed as a building block. But for us, in many ways, the short story is the thing. It's, it's in, um, I'm making an idolized version of it, of course, but we want it to be its own. Let me look what I'm doing with my hands, right? Um, we do want to be surprised. What we're doing is creative work. Um, if it could be a widget, if I could tell you exactly what it was, you know, it'd be sold on the shelves at Target. Um, we are looking for that thing, like any kind of great artwork, where you're seeing something in a new or different way. Um, it doesn't have to be a massive change from what's expected, mm -hmm. um, but just that little wrinkle that makes you think again or feel again in a different way is something that we're looking for. And, and I do understand writers' frustration with with editors where it's like, well, you're not saying anything particularly useful or, or what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. um, this really is um, a, a thing we do that's more feel mm -hmm. than anything. Um, and we, we have to feel engaged and moved, which is increasingly hard to do in a really cynical world. But um, we do hope for these things that surprise us. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, there are a lot of questions coming in. So I'm just gonna uh, <laughs> read right here. Um, so other editors uh, keep mentioning authors that are on their radar. Do you keep a radar, <laughs> uh, whatever that means, of authors that you're maybe, that are new and exciting to you? Um, and how does that figure into your submission queue? Like if, if a author on your radar comes across, sends you a story, um, are they more likely to get a closer read from you? Are they more likely to be accepted? Yeah, um, so the short answer is no, I don't have any authors on my radar. Um, I am aware of, uh, to some extent, which authors I've sent an encouraging note to recently. So I get a daily report. Um, if the name pops out, I might say to um, the first reader assigned to the story, 
hey, no matter what, go ahead and forward this to me when you're done reading it. Just let me know what you think. Um, that's simply, I, I don't, because story is one of like four things that I do, um, I don't have time to like try to cultivate that relationship. Um, one of the things that I've really given up on is I, I'm no longer the first reader on a lot of submissions. Um, I've, I've vetted my staff again, like we've got a whole bunch of brand new readers, really strong, smart people that um, are pointing out things and stories that I might've missed. They get the first read. Um, so it, the, you need to clear the first or second reader before I see something. Um, so I, I just don't have the ability to like kind of comb through, you know, we're on pace for over 5,000 submissions this year. Um, so to look for individuals, um, yeah, I typically don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and so back to contest, does it, this is sort of a general question, but how does it apply to you? Does it ever make sense for a writer to submit the same story to the same magazine for a new contest if they're guest editors? Oh, um, I guess judges, I should say. Yeah. Um, so I've never worked at a magazine. Many years ago, I worked with River Sticks, and there was a, the contest would have a guest editor. Um, but the staff is the one that is the first reader. Um, if you're not listed as a finalist, probably not. Um, mm -hmm because the staff itself is, is the first reader um, before it goes to the guest editor or guest judge. So the short answer is no, probably not. Um, and so we have a question from someone who has been working on a literary journal. Um, and he says that oftentimes when we choose a story, they chose it quickly. Um, and it seems to indicate that it's better to submit early in the reading period rather than later because decisions have already been, been made. Uh, and this came up actually in a recent discussion. I didn't, I think it's a great question and I wasn't sure what to tell people. I, my sense is that if a submission period is open, then it's open. Um, but is there an advantage to submitting earlier or even toward the end of a reading period? So it depends on the magazine. Um, usually places that close are based at a university. Um, so there's a, um, a semester that they're working on. So I think it might help. I mean, you'd have to really dive into the magazine itself to know the answer to that. I'm not, I'm not sure you want to spend that kind of time doing so. Mm -hmm. um, it might make a difference, but I, I, I don't think it's worth worrying about one way or the other. I think if a, if a reading period is August 1st to December 31st, I don't think it makes any difference one way or the other. Um, story reads all year round. Um, it doesn't make any difference to us. Um, if for whatever reason, um, and I, I don't know what, how this would even work, um, I might take a story and rather than have put it in the next issue, I'll put it two issues down the road, but um, I don't know why I would do that. Um, yeah, don't make yourself crazy trying to figure that one out. Yeah, just send whenever the window's open. Mm -hmm. And back to uh, themes that you want to see more of or less of, uh, someone wants to know, are you sick of COVID stories? <laughs> are there well, a lot of those? Actually, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, one of the challenges of COVID stories is that the nonfiction publications in, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, I mean, even a magazine like Texas Monthly, um, contemporary nonfiction first person stories about COVID have been really compelling. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, very difficult to write good fiction about COVID while you're still in it. Um, so I'm not tired of them. I have not seen one that's particularly compelling mm. because I don't know if we yet have kind of the, the emotional distance from this thing to, um, to tell a fictive story, right? Um, I could of course be proven wrong, you know, tomorrow. Um, but I, I'm not tired of those stories at all. I actually have not seen a ton of them. Mm -hmm. um, so if you got a COVID story, give us a shot. That's really funny. That's consistent. Every editor I've interviewed so far has said they actually have not been seeing that many COVID related submissions that people are writing. A lot of people are writing about childhood and nostalgia and kind of wanting to be anywhere else, <laughs> but this present moment. Yeah, it, I don't, um, it's interesting. I mean, as a writer, I have not been particularly interested in writing a COVID story. Mm -hmm. That isn't something that, um, has struck me yet as being particularly compelling, at least for me personally as a fiction writer. Um, yeah, I haven't seen anything where I'm like, oh, I haven't thought of that in a way that's, um, you know, really working for me as an editor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so if you send an encouraging 
rejection letter or nice rejection letter? Should a writer wait before sending you something new? Or if they have something ready to go, should they just send it the next day? Yeah, go ahead and send it the next day. I mean, it's not, uh, <laughs> I think right now we're reading stuff from early April, so it's not getting read right away anyway. Um, so no, if you get that kind of encouraging note and you have a, another story that is definitely done, and I, I think that's maybe the key thing to, to emphasize, um, by all means, send it to us uh, right away. And what is your typical response time? Ooh, uh, get ready for me to lie. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, I think we're saying on the submission page, 10 to 12 weeks. Um, uh, it's probably a little bit closer to four months now. Um, we had um, a, a lot of volunteers left. Um, the internship program ended. I had to vet new readers. We got backed up really fast, which is great. I mean, we, we love having a lot of options to choose from. Um, I think I just assigned work from the first week of April, maybe the last week of March to give you some kind of idea of the time frame. Mm -hmm. our, our goal is to be three months. I mean, that's what we're aiming for. Um, but we've pushed a little bit further out than I would like, and we're, we're trying to clean that up. And if a writer, if it takes a long time to hear back, no one should assume anything. Um, they shouldn't assume that they've been rejected. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that, with the submission manager, it's always easy to check. Mm -hmm. um, I think all it says that is we've received it. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't heard from us, we haven't made a decision. Um, and just there's some ebb and flow with how quickly we're reading submissions. Um, it'll often happen with the magazine if they're running a contest. The contest takes priority, the regular submissions back. Uh, that's just part of the literary magazine world. And in this is a big question in terms of the magazine's curation, in terms of your vision for it. Uh, do you look for an anchor story and then curate around that? Or how do you find a common thread uh, among the different submissions? I mean, and yeah. I guess I, I'll actually tie it to an acceptance, but like if you start to see a theme developing from what you've accepted, will you cater more acceptances around that theme? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so the short answer is no, I don't think of an anchor story. It's, it's really a rolling process for us. Um, once we have a couple of stories accepted, I might look at them and think, um, okay, well, what, um, what am I leaning towards or looking for um, that I haven't seen? Or is there something that um, thematically ties them all together? Um, I have not seen that, but I also typically don't think too much about it. Theme issues are really tricky. Um, you know, you state a theme issue and if it's too broad, almost anything can fit, it's too narrow, you don't get enough good stuff. Um, so we don't have a particular theme with story. Um, you know, our, our name is a little arrogant. I mean, to be story, to say that we represent what short stories are doing right now, um, we need to have a broad spectrum. Um, we're probably not as broad as we should be, but again, kind of my limitations as an editor and publisher, I do have to be cognizant of that. Um, so thematically, it's not something that I typically think of, but I would guess that somebody that has read us closely might see a few things that, uh, you know, I'm responding to subconsciously. Sorry, had to, there was a, someone mowing the lawn outside. Um, so many journals now are mindful of, of avoiding racism and sexism vis-a-vis -vis submitter demographics, um, but ageism seems largely to be ignored. I hear this a lot. Um, and I'm curious what the, what the age demographic, this person is curious what the age demographic of your readers is. Um, and is that something you think about in terms of the submissions, like trying to vary age perspectives? Um, actually, we do. Um, it's something we are very conscious. Um, it's interesting. I had this discussion when I was at the Missouri Review um, when I was talking with my students and they said, well, why don't we just publish what's good? I was like, well, define good, um, which of course led to one conversation. But the other thing is that, you know, if we publish 40 stories in a year, story 41, 42, and 43, if we were ranking them all, are pretty good stories. Um, what goes into the decision about what gets into the magazine and what doesn't. Um, we do think, you know, I was mentioning like I'm halfway through an issue. I may not be responding to theme, but I might start thinking about, okay, what's not being represented yet? Who, what am I not seeing? Um, and so publishing work by writers that are older or that have characters that are older is something that I do look for. 
actually respond um, stronger to, to a lot of the work where the characters are older because you know we get so much stuff from um, MFA programs and PhD programs. Typically, they don't write about people that are older, right? We typically write about people that look and sound like themselves. I, I think we all do that. So it is something that that we look for. Um, one of the stories um, that we published early is, is called Nude by Claudia Hins, um, which deals with people living in Florida and um, you know, readjusting to retirement and their sexuality and trying to think about, you know, what are we doing here at this state of, of our marriage? Um, so that's just one example of a type of story that deals with being older. Um, I think Michelle Herman's story does as well um, as a theme that we're conscious of and making sure that we represent in the magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and so can you talk about what's on the horizon for story? Any changes coming up? Any new developments that um, people can start to get excited about? Yeah, so the uh, oft delayed summer issue will ship. <laughs> um, that has 12 stories, including uh, the second annual Story Foundation Prize winner. Um, we're looking for work for the autumn issue right now. I believe we've taken eight stories, though four of them are flash stories. So we actually have a ton of room mm. for fellow writers uh, in our fall issue. Um, we're back on campus with our Denison students in the fall. Um, we did a summer reading series our first year, but that of course stopped with the pandemic. Um, we hope to relaunch that next summer. Um, and we've thought a little bit more about other things that we might be able to do to expand our readership and our reach. Um, we're, we've been very happy with the response to our e-newsletter, um, mm -hmm. but thinking that we can do a little bit more in terms of what we can provide for our community um, and our readership, and, and then just try to keep growing, try to get more subscribers and make sure we're sustainable. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't realize you guys published flash fiction. That's really cool. So it's uh, flash fiction, sort of regular size stories, and then also uh, long short stories up to 25,000 words. Is that correct? So the full range there. Yeah. So our submission manager now lists those three categories. We okay. made change January 1st. Um, we made the decision to stop publishing nonfiction, um, better branding for the magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and, and under Travis's editorial ship um, for issues one, two, and three, they also took poetry. Um, I'm just not the best poetry editor. Um, I can see the argument that you can tell a story with a couple of poems. I just think that's the best way of representing um, what the magazine's about and frankly, what I can do well. So we do have the three categories. Um, we call flash fiction under 2000, which I think is fairly generous. Um, I think the two, let's see, we took two pieces for the fall that are 600 words each one that's 1,400, I think the other one's 1,000. So there's some variety in terms of the word count there. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've actually made it through the whole list of questions. And I'm wondering, <laughs> these, these are fabulous questions. Thank you so much to everyone who chimed in. Um, for people who want to get more involved with the magazine um, as readers, as interns, is that something you put out a public call for at any time? We have. Um, we did recently do a call for um, new volunteer readers. I took a whole bunch of them. Um, mm -hmm. And I, at some point, I think I just stopped because I had 15 new people and I, I can't vet them all. I did see it come up um, in the chat. I see the transcript going by. So whoever asked about that, um, just drop me an email. I'm happy to write you back. Um, we're always happy to have volunteers. We, we ask a lot of them. They do come and go. Um, that is something that we, we'd love to have more of. Um, the internship, because we're um, working with Denison University, that's not really open outside of, of the college. Um, but hopefully, you know, it's one of those things that maybe because we're Columbus based, we might expand in the future. But for right now, internships is not something that we actually offer. Okay. Um, if somebody asks about like, oh, can you move up in the magazine? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Like, you're just like, you're us, you know? <laughs> I, I wish this was a uh, paying gig with a 401k, but that's just not how it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, one more question here. Do you, for the flash submissions, um, do you prefer connected flash or should they just be standalone? Um, how, how do you like to see those submissions? Uh, entirely up to the author. Okay. Uh, when we first started doing um, that at the beginning of the year, flash fiction, short story, long story, um, I found that people weren't paying any attention to those uh, choices. I mean, we read it no matter what, but um, the the first two months of uh, flash fiction was kind of all over the place. Um, so yeah, I trust the author. You know, if, if you have some kind of a triptych, if you have individual ones, if you want to send us five, 
Um, sure, whatever works. That's great. Um, well, thank you so very much for taking the time. So people can find the magazine storymagazine.com. Is that? Uh, I'll, I will, of course, link yeah. to it. <laughs> and on Twitter, story underscore. S Nine. Story lit mag, I think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I <will. laughs> it's so funny. Editors never know their own Twitter accounts, but I'll 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 put all the links in the in the uh, post. So thank you so much, Michael. This was really really informative and great to talk to you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's good to see you. It's been a long time since we. I know. I was pregnant and last time I saw you. <laughs> that is a long time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, and I just. Appreciate everybody coming to the Zoom and, and asking these great questions and giving us an audience. Um, it really does mean a lot to both me and Becky to have people listening to what we're doing and support. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much.